in here, and we're going to dive into our series today called Ever Wonder. And I was seated on a pew with my parents, and uh, we were in our church in the suburbs of Atlanta. And uh, on this particular day, I was sitting on one end of the pew, and my mom and dad were sitting on the far end of the other pew. That's probably because I wanted to be as far away from my mom who could pinch me if I was misbehaving. (laughs) My mom and dad are here today. But there was something strange that service. I've been in lots of services before. My whole life, it seemed. But on this particular uh, evening, I saw uh, something that just caught my attention. Out at the front of the church, in in front of uh, the podium where the preacher would preach, there was this stack of shiny silver little towers. And um, it looked like this, like this picture. Anybody ever seen anything like those things before? Let me see your hand. Okay. So my kid curiosity is going crazy, you know. I'm like, what's in there? Why did they bring this in? Why is it at the front of the church, you know? What's going to happen? And so for, my, for the whole service, my eyes are like transfixed on those things, you know? And it was maybe because the trays had caught my attention. It was maybe because the Holy Spirit was doing something in my young life and getting me ready to receive what he wanted to share with me that was going to change my life forever. But while I'm sitting there staring at the silver trays, I actually listened to the preacher that night. Maybe for the first time in my memory, I listened. And and what he was saying was amazing. See, he was talking about Jesus, but, but that's not really amazing. He talked about Jesus every week. What was amazing now is that he was talking about Jesus' death. And... um. He started talking about the last meal that Jesus had with his disciples, how they walked out into the garden to pray. He talked about how Jesus prayed in the garden so much till he sweat drops of blood. And, man, he had me then. I was, like, all in. I was listening intently. Um, He talked about how the soldiers arrested him, how they beat him up and made fun of him. He talked about how they made a crown from a thorn bush and, pressed it in into his head, and and then he talked about the whipping. And and the way that the preacher described what they did to Jesus, how they mercifully, mercilessly beat him, and how his back was bleeding, it was the most gripping story that I'd ever heard. And then it continued. He talked about how Jesus carried his cross out to a place where he would be killed. And yeah, yeah, I'd I'd seen pictures of Jesus, and I'd known about the cross. I mean, crosses are everywhere, right? But now, for the first time in my young life, it was alive. Like, I I could see it in my imagination, just like it was happening. Crowded streets, and Jesus is stumbling, and there's blood, and and dust, and and then there was the nails. And they're hammering into Jesus' hands and his feet. And the emotions inside of me are just welling up. You know, I'm I'm just overcome with it. And then finally, the preacher describes Jesus being lifted up on on this cross between two thieves. Some people mocking him, some people mourning him. Darkness enveloping them all. And then Jesus, the Son of God, dies. And, And then... Somewhat quietly, the preacher comes out from behind the pulpit and he reaches into these silver trays. And he pulls out a little piece of bread, a little cracker, and he pulls out a little cup. And he says, Jesus did that for you. And in just a minute, we're going to celebrate and remember what Jesus did for you, because he, because he loves you. And guys, from that moment on, these common little items, you know, a little plastic cup with some juice in it, a little cracker of bread, they have meant something to me. <laughs> 
they like powerfully represent what Jesus did for me, how much he loves me. And uh, I just want to ask you today, what was your first experience with the Lord's Supper? Do you remember? Uh, have you ever wondered why the Lord's Supper is such an important part of following Jesus? Like, what's the big deal, right? Like, it's just some cracker and some grape juice. Or, or, or perhaps maybe you've come from another church tradition and you've wondered, well, when I, since I've been coming to the crossing, like, why do you do it that way? Why, why do you celebrate the Lord's Supper in this particular way here at the crossing? Well, if you've ever wondered that, <laughs> today's your day. Because we're going to do an epic deep dive into the Lord's Supper. And we're going to try to answer three key questions. First, what is the Lord's Supper? And then second, we're going to try to talk about why the Lord's Supper is significant in the life of the follower of Jesus. And then finally, why do we observe the Lord's Supper here at the crossing? So if you have your note sheet and your Bible, take them out because you're going to need both today. All right? Let's start by answering that first question. What is the Lord's Supper? What is the Lord's Supper? What do we mean when we say that? Well, the, just the words, the Lord's Supper, kind of give us a clue, right? Who's the Lord? Jesus. Yeah, you got to help me. Who's the Lord? Jesus. Yeah, and the supper is referring to the last meal that he shared with his closest disciples the night that he was crucified. Now, guys, if you read your scripture, you know that this meal is mentioned in all four of the Gospels. And the Apostle Paul brings it up in one of his letters to the church. Uh, so in Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, John 13, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're getting really different views of the exact same story. Matthew, Mark, and, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell it very, very similarly. So we're going to go to Mark chapter 14 and try to see what we're talking about when we say the Lord's Supper. So Mark chapter 14, it says this, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, everybody look at this, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I love that. Check out what Jesus says next. I tell you the truth. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So right from the beginning in this reading from Mark, we notice that there are two main components to this meal, this last supper that Jesus had. Did y'all catch those two things? The bread and a cup. A bread and the cup. And for each item, the bread and the cup, Jesus assigned a very special meaning. I hope you caught that. And so I want you to write this down in your notes. The bread and the cup are two enduring concepts that we still observe in the Lord's Supper. The bread and the cup are two enduring concepts that we still observe in the Lord's Supper. Our movement, Foursquare, which this church is a part of, defines the Lord's Supper as a commemoration. So I'm going to put this up here on the screen, and uh, I would love for you maybe to write this down in your notes. I'm having a little difficulty clicking. You may help me out there, Josh. <laughs> oh yeah, thank you. It calls the Lord's Supper a commemoration. Anybody ever heard that word before? Commemoration? Write this down. Commemoration is a remembrance typically expressed in a ceremony. A remembrance typically expressed in a ceremony. That's what a commemoration is. So here's what the Foursquare, our denomination, says in its doctrinal statement about the Lord's Supper. It says this. Oh, Josh, you'll have to help me with those backgrounds again. Thank you. It says, we believe in the commemoration and observing of the Lord's Supper by the sacred use of broken bread, a precious type 
of the bread of life, even Jesus Christ, whose body was broken for us, and by the juice of the vine, a blessed type which should ever remind the participant of the shed blood of the Savior, who is the true vine of which his children are the branches. That's what Foursquare has to say uh, about the bread and the cup. Thank you guys so much for helping me out with that. We believe that the Lord's Supper is a remembrance ceremony, using the bread and the juice to symbolize the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. That's it. In the simplest of terms, that's what the Lord's Supper is. It's a remembrance ceremony, using these common items to remind us of the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. A remembrance of Jesus sacrificially giving his body, giving his blood for us. Um, so that's what it is. But maybe you've wondered, well, if, if, if that's what it is, why is it, why is it so important? Why is it such a big deal in our worship? Why have followers of Jesus continued to eat the bread and drink the cup for over 2,000 years? Well, if that's your question, I'd love to talk about that answer, okay? So why is the Lord's Supper so significant in the life of the follower of Jesus? Well, I would like to illustrate it to you uh, with a simple illustration. And if you've been at the crossing for a while, you've probably uh, seen us talk about this. W.W. Criswell, who is a Bible scholar, uh, used a term that I really, really love in describing what's going on in all of history. And he says it like this. Throughout history, there is a scarlet thread that tells the story of the redemption of mankind. All of history actually is centered on Jesus, the story of how he made humans, how humans fell, how he gave his life at the cross, and how he will one day come again to redeem us all, is is kind of like a scarlet thread that if you look closely, you can trace all throughout human history. I love what Eugene Peterson says. I love this quote. Eugene Peterson says, Jesus is the dictionary in which we look up the very meaning of our words. The idea of the scarlet thread that runs through all of history is this. You can see Jesus in everything, in everything. So if you will, let's go in our mental time machines and just travel along this thread, if you will, for just a moment, okay? Way, way, way back, close to the, be- the beginning, God created Adam and Eve. And there in his presence, they hung out, but you know that there was a serpent, right? And the serpent came, deceived them, told them lies about who they were. They bought it, and sin entered into the story of of humanity. And because sin entered in, there was a, a break, a breach between God and, and man, between Adam and Eve and God. The close fellowship that they once experienced was, was broken. And there in the garden, God kills an animal, takes the skin of that animal, and, and they clothes Adam and Eve, covering up their their sins, blood was shed even in the garden to cover their sins from the very beginning. I want you to stay with that. And then if you read over in Hebrews chapter 9, you know that the scripture says this, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So like right, right at the beginning, there was pointing toward Jesus and what would happen here at the cross. And then just to, uh, you slide forward and you go to Genesis chapter 22 and you get this awesome story about Father Abraham, right? He's taking his son up to the mountain. They're going to make a sacrifice there. Y'all remember this story. But the scripture says in um, Genesis chapter 22, verse 7, 
that the son, Isaac, turned to Abraham and he says, Father, yes, my son, we have fire and the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? You know, uh, what's going to happen is Abraham believes he's about to sacrifice his son. Interesting, huh? Doesn't that remind you of a, another story? Yeah? And so what happens is uh, there, Isaac is wondering where is the offering going to come from? And then Abraham says something amazing, and it's prophetic, because he says God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering. And so they keep on going. And when they get up to the top of the mountain, it's, an, it's amazing, because right there as Abraham raises up his knife, they hear a ram that's caught over here in the, in the, in the thicket, and that's the sacrifice. They kill that. The blood is, is shed on that altar, right, to cover the sins in that situation. And I love what Abraham says after that moment. He named the place Yahweh Yira, Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Like, can you sit here in history and look down there and see the cross? Right? The Lord will provide. And people still use that name. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So, so cool that you can see Jesus through every page of the Scripture. Several hundred years more, um, Abraham's kids are all slaves in Egypt. Y'all know this story, right? The Israelites are there, and God sends Moses to deliver them from their slavery And the night before their big exodus, God gives some very, very special instructions. And this isn't by chance. It's actually part of the great story of our redemption. He says this to them. He says, announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. Okay, that's interesting. I'm going to skip a few verses, but he goes on in uh, verse 6. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the community must slaughter their lamb or goat at twilight. Again, bloodshed, right? Blood is shed. This is what God continues to tell them. They're to take some of this blood, smear it on the sides and the top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. Okay? putting blood out there. Why are they doing that? Scripture says this, on that night, God says, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign marking the house where you're staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Yeah. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. So here in Egypt, powerful symbols of what would happen at the death of Jesus. His blood shed to cover our sins. Are you tracking with it? Are you seeing? You seeing how it goes? So then um, hundreds of years later, the prophet Isaiah, he would write specifically about this lamb. He would say this, he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a what? You seen it? To the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open up his mouth. You can see what Jesus did at the cross way, way back then. He said in verse 4, it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment for God a punishment for his own sins, but he was pierced for our rebellion. Crushed for whose sins? Our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. This is the prophet Isaiah looking forward to what would happen to Jesus giving us this prophecy. It's all part of redemption's story. And then you know these parts really, really well. Because it wasn't very long after that, um, let me go back. Yeah, that Jesus was born. His birth announced to the Virgin Mary. And then we know that John said it like this the Word became human. 
He made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. We have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Jesus came into the scarlet thread of history. He came and made his place here. And man, what a life he lived. Just a few uh, years after that, Jesus is there um, listening to John the Baptist. And it goes like this in John chapter 1. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Look, the what? Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. So even here, right before the cross, John the Baptist looks and says, This is going to be significant. He's going to take away the sins of the world. And that brings us to what we're talking about today, this moment right before the cross, where Jesus and his closest disciples are seated together around a table. I want to read specifically from Luke chapter 22, because he says here, he took some bread and gave thanks to God, and then he gave pieces to the disciples, and he said, this is my body, and I'm giving it for you. Pretty cool. He he then takes the cup, and he says, This is my blood that is poured out as a sacrifice for you. This bread and this cup is a symbol of my great love for you. I hope you can see the significance of the Lord's Supper. For me, it's like this, and maybe you want to jot this down in your notes. The Lord's Supper connects all of the dots along the scarlet thread of redemption history. It's like in this meal where Jesus says, my body and my blood, all of it makes sense. (laughs) What happened in the beginning, what happened through the ages, it all comes together when Jesus says, guys, all of history, it's me. All of it is, is me giving my life for you. Jesus is tying together the scarlet thread of salvation history. When he says, this bread is my body and this wine is my blood, for us, it all makes sense. Like it comes together in a really, really powerful way. It's been symbolized and set up for millennium and centuries Arriving here at the Lord's Supper, it's completely explained. I love that. It just it, it makes sense. The Lord's table is historically significant because it brings together all that God has planned to do and will do in our lives moving forward. This bread is my body, this wine is my blood is pretty significant. It's a very important remembrance. So, when we receive the Lord's Supper, we are remembering, friends, the story of everything. It's it's not just a, a, a cracker and some juice. In fact, it ties me together with the story that God has performed throughout the ages. If you can think about it this way, the universal work of God is brought directly into my life when I remember his body and his blood broken for me. Incredibly significant. So let's answer this. Why do we observe the Lord's Supper here at the crossing, particularly? Well, I want to give you two ways that we observe the Lord's Supper, and both of them are very important for us here in our community as we follow Jesus together in Mena, Arkansas. First, we observe the Lord's Supper here at the Crossing as a designed memorial. Designed memorial. You might want to write that down in your notes. A designed memorial. If you go back to the scarlet thread of history, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And then just on the other side of the cross, as the early church 
began to worship Jesus, and the church of Jesus spread throughout the Roman Empire, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in in Greece, in Corinth, and he gives them some instructions about how to observe the Lord's Supper. Let's go there, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says, I'm passing on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Let's all read this next sentence together. Do this in remembrance of me. So, we just will pause right there and say, this is a designed memorial following the command of Jesus. And that's why we observe the Lord's Supper here at the crossing. It's Jesus' instructions to us. Let's go on and finish that scripture. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me, there it is again, as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. Every time we do it, as often as we do it, we're remembering Jesus. And, and guys, you can already see we have tables here. In, in just a few minutes, we're all going to be able to participate in a designed memorial that Jesus himself set up. Like he instituted this. We're carrying on, when we receive the bread and the cup, we're carrying on a tradition that Christ himself put together. Amen? So we're doing what he asked us to do. And I want to also remind you that when we take this cup and this bread in just a few minutes, we are joining in with what they estimate is about 3 billion other followers of Jesus around the world who are taking a cup and taking some bread and remembering Jesus. That's huge. That we are following in the tradition that Jesus gave for us that not only is what he told us to do, but what he told all his followers to do, and we have that in common. Did you hear what I said? We have that in common with all of those who remember Jesus in the same way. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. (laughs) Because throughout history, the people of God have struggled to understand how they wanted to observe the Lord's Supper, right? And it's caused some pretty interesting conversations. But together with baptism, the Lord's Supper is one of the few things that all, that all Christians, our followers of Jesus, participate in. The baptism, which we'll talk about next week, and the Lord's Supper. So let's just go in history and talk a little bit about this time frame, from the cross, from the early church, to where we are now. Because see, in the years immediately following Jesus going back to heaven, the early church celebrated the Lord's Supper, or some version of it, every day. The scriptures say in Acts chapter 2, that to every day they gathered together, and they, and they had a meal together, and they observed the Lord's Supper. Now, it was probably during this time, early, early on, and probably in connection with Jesus' last meal with his disciples, because we know that they actually had a full meal in observance of the Passover, which was back in history. They began to like combine the, the bread and the cup as part of a, a meal together. They called this um, the love feast, right? Sounds awesome. Or the agape meal. And what what happened is the the people would get together, the followers of Jesus, and they would eat food together, hang out. Sounds a whole lot like circles, right? And and at some point in, in the meal, they would pause and go, here's a cup, here's bread. We remember the body and the blood of Jesus that was given for us. And and that's what what they did. And we know from um the early writers, the early church fathers that at the Lord's table, at at the cup, at the meal that they shared together, 
it was like the great equalizer. It brought everybody together. So one a church historian said that when they observed the Lord's death together, they forgot all distinctions of rank and wealth and culture. It was the one thing that brought people together. They, they could sit across the Lord's table from someone who was uh, from a different nation as them, who spoke a different language. Well, slaves could meet with masters, and they could be unified at, at the cup. A really awesome thing. Um, some early church fathers, uh, Cyprian, Chrysostom, uh, they both record in their writings that even unto, until the late 300s A.D., the followers of Jesus were observing the Lord's Supper daily. Hmm. Augustine, another very influential uh, voices of his time, he, though, kind of contradicted that in the late 300s, and he said, you know, the Lord's Supper, uh, how people observe it varies from place to place. Some people uh, observe it daily, some people observe it weekly, some at other times, and some have no set pattern at all. And what Augustine said, and he's very influential in, in church history, what he said was, the point is that Jesus says, when you do it, as often as you do it, always remember me. So Augustine's point was, from the very beginning, there wasn't really a set pattern that we can detect from the Scripture that you must do it this on these days, on these certain times, or whatever. And that tradition is kind of carried on. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he, it, during this time, he addressed some uh, abuses that were going on of this meal. And the early church fathers all echoed this concern. People were getting together at this party, and the rich folks were eating the best stuff and gorging themselves, and those that didn't have enough were missing out. And they took what the Lord set up to be an awesome way to bring people together, and it became a, a divisive thing. And so, in the 4th and 5th century, the leaders of the church began to kind of move away from the observance of the bread and the cup from sharing a full meal together. And that's when in church history you can, you can actually see a distinction where from that point on, 4th, 5th century A.D., Churches started just having cup and bread and not sharing so much of the meals together. I'm just going to insert a personal opinion right here. I think it's still really important to get together as followers of Jesus. You know what I mean? Very, very important. Uh, historian Philip Schaff describes this development of separating the meal from the observance as taking what should be a simple feast of the Savior's dying love and transforming it into the cause of the most bitter disputes and theological controversies. <laughs> because since that moment, and I know you know this, most of the followers of Jesus have pretty much been arguing about how to do it. <laughs> right? We do. <laughs> the elements of the Lord's Supper, the bread, the, the, the cup, they were fought over. Does, are we supposed to use unleavened bread or leavened bread? Do we use wine or do we use grape juice? Are you supposed to stand when you take it or are you supposed to sit? Maybe, wait, wait, you're supposed to kneel. What are you supposed to do? And so all of these questions and literally hundreds more questions like that became to be dividing points among the people of God. And like, look, guys, this is an amazing field of study. I think you I should just get into it and dig into it. But it'll take you into some pretty weird places. Pretty weird things that some of us believe about this or that, right? But for us this morning, we're trying to answer the question, why do we observe it the way we do here at the crossing? I would just like to say it's probably enough to say that the Lord's Supper has always been an important aspect of worship for the followers of Jesus. Even though it's caused many fights and divisions among us, it's important enough for us to continue to do. And we're trying to grow in our understanding and following the example of the command of Jesus. So, with respect to all of our traditions, with respect to our movement's doctrinal position, which we read earlier, we want to, here at the crossing, focus on what the Scriptures seem to emphasize. Like, what do the Scriptures really, really emphasize? 
And in all the passages that we read from the gospel, what we just read from the Apostle Paul, what is emphasized is always the bread, always the cup, always to remember. Always the bread, always the cup, and always to remember. So why do we take the cup? We take it to remember. Why don't we eat the bread? We eat it to remember. You know, uh, Jennifer and I, we love to keep memories alive. And, and Jen has this amazing habit, which our kids have grown to loathe. But that is, on the date of their birthday, she sits them down and goes through the moments of their birth. Like, before they were born, what happened, when she went into labor, how it felt. We tell the whole story every year at every birthday. Why do we do that? We want them to remember what happened and be able to pass that story down. Why do we here at the crossing go over and over and receive the bread and cup over and over again? Because it's a design memorial, and we don't want to forget. Can I hear an amen? amen? And then finally, and I would offer even deeper than a remembrance, we here at the crossing believe that in observing the Lord's Supper, we have a very special invitation to receive. You might want to jot that down. An invitation to receive. When we observe the Lord's Supper, Jesus is offering us an opportunity to receive something very special. And I would just suggest to you, friends, that the Lord's Supper is a design memorial. It's historically significant. But in our lives, it can even be more. Go with me to John 6. In John 6, we read of Jesus miraculously feeding multitudes, and then later that evening, he's walking on water in the middle of a storm. The next day, Jesus and his followers are surrounded again by a crowd. And the conversation turns to food again, because that's the way we humans are. We want to eat. And the crowd begins to ask Jesus for a miraculous sign. You know, the day before, they'd just seen him multiply food. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they wanted uh, Jesus to feed him again. But this is, this is what said. Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? <laughs> After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said, I want you to catch this. I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. Who's he talking about? Himself. Talking about himself. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is telling them what it's all about. And so they just say, uh, yeah, give us that bread too. We'll take it every day, every day. Jesus said, and I love this, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And here it is, this symbol, right? Bread. Do you think it's a coincidence that Jesus calls himself the bread of life? It's all a part of the scarlet thread of redemption history, right? Jesus is the bread. And he, he said, if you come to me, you won't be hungry again. Jesus says, God sent bread, and it's me. I am the I'm the bread of life. He goes down in verse 41 in this, in this awesome passage. He said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. He just, he just continues to hammer it. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. Now, I don't know if, this, if, you're, if you're getting this, but we're about to eat the bread that symbolizes Jesus. And what is Jesus saying? Wow. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my flesh. 
It's what Jesus him, himself said. Jesus is saying, I'm the bread that you really need. I will give you life. I will sustain you. But his hearers, they just couldn't get past the idea of physically eating, right? They couldn't, they couldn't break away from, what do you mean, eat? What do you mean, eat your flesh, right? And they began to have a freak out over eating his literal flesh. And Jesus, I love this, in John 6, he doesn't really pause to explain it. He just doubles down and says it more. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life with me. Do you know that the Bible says some challenging things to us sometimes? What? That's what he says. You, you cannot have eternal life. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. Amen. For my flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. <laughs> Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Remember he said to the disciples in John 15, remain in me, and I in you. You'll bear much fruit as long as you stay connected with me. Jesus is saying here, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're staying with me. You're staying with me. You're remaining in my presence. This amazing discussion from the Sea of Galilee had to be in the minds of the disciples when they were there at the table. As Jesus held the bread and he held the cup, they had to be remembering that he had said, you got to eat this bread. You got to eat Eat my flesh, drink my blood, or else you won't like have any part in me. So what he's saying is, I believe eating and drinking the bread and the cup is in some way receiving all that Jesus is and all that he has to offer into my life. I believe Jesus is giving us an invitation to receive him. I believe that he's talking not about physical eating as much as he is consuming or going all in in believing in what he's about. He says, you got to consume me. You got to take me in. You got to bring it all into your life. When he says, eat my flesh, drink my blood, it's he, Jesus is saying, when you take this cup and when you take this bread, you're saying, Jesus, all of you, I want. All of you, I want you, Lord, and I need you in my life. And, and Crossing Friends, today, I believe the invitation to receive is just the same as Jesus was saying in John chapter 6. When we gather around his table in just a few moments, Jesus is saying to you, will you partake of the bread of life? Will you Receive me and go all in with me. Consume everything about me and let me be the thing that sustains you and gives you energy and motivates you. It's a very similar invitation. We can, at this moment, make a choice to receive Jesus into our lives as, as all that we need. Um, I'm reminded of a recent trip that I took to Vietnam, and we had traveled up by boat to a small river dock, right? And uh, get out of this boat, we climb up some stairs up this steep bank, and under a thatched roof, there was a rough wooden table that was uh, set up, and at this table, there was some fruit, and uh, there was uh, a, little, a little bit of fixings, but also at this table was, was this, that's a fish, <laughs> if you didn't notice it. And, and, and it, <laughs> they had taken a fish directly out of the river and just dropped it into some hot oil and then put it on a plate for me to eat. And it's like all there, scales, guts, little eyeballs looking at you. <laughs> and in, the, in, that, in that moment, like, I'm looking at that fish kind of side-eyed like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to eat that. <laughs> what? And I look at the friends that are with me around that table, and I'm going, 
you guys going to eat that? I mean, <laughs> this is really weird, you know. And, and so, but the hosts are so ge- gracious. They're so generous. I can't not eat it and look like a complete jerk, you know. So what do I do, right? I, I take my fork and I kind of pick at it, stir it around a little bit, put some underneath the table, underneath the plate, you know. Pick and ch- I try to make it look like I've, I've gotten into that fish, right? But I didn't like it, and I didn't really consume it. Do you understand? And guys, I think that that's exactly what we do sometimes with the Lord's Supper. It's exactly what we do with Jesus, right? He is the bread of life sent from heaven. He will bring into our lives what we need not only to live a flourishing and abundant life here and now, but for all times. And yet we just kind of pick and choose what we want to do and hide a little bit and don't really go all in to receive Jesus, who he is and what he says as my God's, my complete life in him. And so this morning, just a few moments as we get ready to receive the Lord's Supper. We're going to remember what He's done for us. But we're also going to be given the opportunity to receive Him and to say, Jesus, I take Your bread, Your your blood, and I want all that You have for me and receive His presence into our life in a very awesome and special way. Would you guys just kind of bow your heads with me across the room right now? This sacred moment that we're about to experience together is something that all of us can experience. If you are a follower of Jesus here at the crossing, we say that it's open to you to come and receive the bread and the cup. And as we do this together, I just want to encourage every single one of us to come to this moment with deep reverence, with understanding of what it means and how it connects us to the great work of God throughout all history, and also to personally receive. Come Holy Spirit, as we receive the body and blood of Jesus, prepare our hearts in your name. If I could ask you to, um, real quietly and solemnly, would everybody please who would like uh, to participate come and get a cup and a piece of bread and then make it back to your seat? It'll take just a moment. Prefer each other. Take turns. There's two tables here in the front, and then at the very back, there's another table. Just get a piece of bread and a cup and take it back with you to your seat. Could I invite you to, once you've received your cup and your bread, just hold it there in your hands and perhaps just in a prayerful remembrance, you could let your mind go back to all that Jesus did for you at the cross, all that he has done for you through his blood. Remember his faithfulness and his sustenance for you throughout the years, how he's been all that you ever needed and more. Can you just, as you're holding the bread and cup, just remember just how awesome Jesus is. Remember how awesome Jesus is. few more coming to be served. Just take your time. 
we're holding the cup and the bread and we're just remembering Jesus. I invite you to stand with me now that most all have been served. Stand if you could hold your cup and and bread. It's with thanksgiving that we approach this Lord's Supper now with so much thankfulness and gratitude in our heart for the body and the blood of Jesus given for us. May we receive today your presence, Lord, and all that you have for us. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took some bread, broke it, and gave thanks. He said, take and eat. This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you take the bread and eat it together? way, he took the cup, said this cup is a new covenant, sealed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. Every time we do this, we do it in remembrance of Jesus. And we just worship Jesus together.